Okay. This is our third attempt at trying to go live. <laughs> but now the link I provided is not correct. Why? Because it's a different video. Oh. But I need to get started because on the replay, it can't be minutes of me waiting. <laughs> so um, today is July 1st. Yes, it is. Which is uh, Bank Employee Day in Guatemala. So you chose that as the theme. So the inspiration for today's theme, uh, yes, bank heists. Mm -hmm. All right. So this poll was interesting because there was almost like a three-way split mm -hmm. between Inside Man, Heat, and Dog Day Afternoon. Point Break and Bonnie and Clyde didn't get much love. Well, I voted for Bonnie and Clyde because I want to rewatch that. But I was them. certain Bonnie and Clyde would win. But Dog Day Afternoon won. I would have voted for Heat because I I haven't seen that. Heat's great. Yeah. I mean, these are all, well, Point Break is a fun. I like Point Break. The other four, I think, are excellent films. But there is so much to talk about uh, Talk about in this movie. So the director? Uh, Sidney Lumet. Who I know. For many, many things. You actually just watched Guilty as Sin with Rebecca De Mornay and Don Johnson quite recently. Oh, that was good. You've seen this. Well, fun. Yeah. I mean, his 90s work was not the greatest, but um, <clears throat> A Stranger Among Us you've seen with Melanie Griffith going undercover as the Hasidic Jew, um, which I'm not going to say that's good, but it's fun. But, uh, you know, his debut was 12 Angry Men. Uh, I, he has several masterpieces, uh, in, and among those, I would also include uh, The Fugitive Kind with Marlon Brando and Anna Magnani. Um, of course, Network. He also did The Wiz, which you're familiar with, because he was uh, his wife at the time, who's Jenny Lumet's mother, uh, was the daughter of Lena Horne. So Lena Horne was his mother in law for a while. Uh, Serpico also is another masterpiece with Al Pacino. You said I watched this movie when? You did in about 2010 when we were living in Minnesota. Oh, gosh. I didn't remember it. Uh, so I do think this movie has to be watched with the documentary The Dog. Uh, sure. Yeah. Because The Dog is basically uh, the main character. Because this movie is based on a true story. The main character talking about his life overall. But for the movie Dog Day Afternoon, the story is three amateur bank robbers plan to hold up a bank, a nice simple robbery, walk in, take the money and run. Unfortunately, the supposedly uncomplicated heist suddenly becomes a bizarre nightmare as everything that could go wrong does. So three guys walk into a bank and try to rob it. One of them immediately chickens out. So the two are left, John and Sal. And they take too damn long to get the money. So, of course, police show up. And then it turns into a hostage situation. And we find out John is robbing the bank to get money to pay for his wife's sex change operation. So his wife uh, is, as the film is saying, and they're saying, a man named Leon. Mm -hmm. Played by Chris Sarandon. And they are saying that... Uh, they're married, that they had a ceremony, even though John is married to a woman named Sally. I forget her name, but he has a wife with who has who he had two children with. Mm -hmm. But he has also said that he's married Leon, who he's calling his wife, and Leon wants a sex change operation. So he needs twenty five hundred dollars to do that. But since the bank robbery went south, now he's thinking he can use the hostages to get a plane out of the country and just be free. To Algeria. To Algeria. But of course, law enforcement is not going to let that happen. They do let him take a bus to the airport to get on a plane. But as soon as they're about to get out of the van, his partner gets shot and killed. So John surrenders the end. I thought this movie was excellent. I had a lot of questions. Then I watched the documentary and it's interesting how the film interprets the real story. Sure. The film is really more about the heist and this man's motives for doing so. And 
Um, it definitely, because what year is this film? 75. It came out Christmas Day, 1975. It's definitely painting a much more generous picture of John, <laughs> like I, a much more kind, humane picture. I agree, John. Well, I I had seen the documentary before the year came out in 2013, or maybe the year after that. But uh, it, revisiting it, it's like, oh yeah, he has kind of a one track mind. Yeah. About sex and you know love, as he would call it. <laughs> We have, I have so many notes. I'm just going to start. So the third robber who leaves, his name is Stevie. So Stevie immediately chickens out. Like once, and they've already started the heist because Sal, who's played by John Cazale, who used to be married to Meryl Streep. Well, I think he was dating Meryl Streep oh, at the time of his death. But you also recently watched The Godfather. You've only seen the first one, but he's Fredo. He plays Pacino's brother in that. He's already like he has the bank manager at gunpoint, so they can't say never mind. We'll try again later. <laughs> so when Stevie leaves, he tries to take the like the getaway car with him. <laughs> uh, I think it's funny that so all of the bank tellers are women, and Al Pacino playing John, he has a filthy mouth. So he's using the F word a lot. And one of the older female bank tellers is telling him like, we've got young girls here. You could watch your language, you know? You mean <laughs> adult girls that are working for a living, but okay. But I think it's interesting because it establishes sort of a friend, the way the film makes it seem is like they had a rapport at a certain point mm -hmm. and they were almost rooting for him. And we see some of the bank tellers kind of like, like they like the excitement and they're kind of, looking forward to like leaving, like it's almost like a vacation. Uh, including the one named Miriam played by Marsha Jean Kurtz, who is one of the uh, talking head witnesses in Spike Lee's Inside Man. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is uh, a woman named Maria who appears to be like the housekeeper of the bank. Mm -hmm. Like she cleans mm -hmm. and she's known to take really long breaks in the bathroom. So while the bank's being robbed and everyone's being held hostage, mm -hmm. she's wearing her like headphones in the bathroom and she's been in there for like damn near an hour, which made me laugh because in a previous position, I was known to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of my coworkers knew. So like after like half an hour, they would text me like, are you still in the bathroom? <laughs> and I'd be in there like watching YouTube videos on Instagram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there she was just in there. Okay, Carol King is in the movie. Carol Kane. Kane, sorry. Not Carol King. I know who she is. Carol Kane's in the movie, looking crazy. <laughs> yeah, this was a big year for her. She was herself Oscar nominated for Best Actress in Hester Street. But she's kind of playing this, like, fragile woman. Mm -hmm. And at a point, um, her boyfriend calls her, or she calls him. The, he They're calls on her. the phone. <laughs> And he's clearly asking her, like, what time are you going to be finished with the bank robbery? <laughs> <laughs> and then so she goes, she asks Al Pacino's character, when are we going to, my boyfriend wants to know when we're going to be done. And he goes, oh, girl, please. <laughs> so his character in the, we have to compare the documentary, but I'll wait. But in the film, his character is not like super openly gay. He does say it at a point that he's homosexual, but. Or he doesn't deny it. I don't think he ever says it. He seems rather, Pacino's seems kind of undefined about it. Like it's just, it, it's more about he has, he has a, a woman that he has children with. And then there's a trans woman that he's wants to run away with. And that's, and they're not, and they're not even using that terminology. It's just, it, yeah. it's kind of just, just the facts. There's a black security guard, that poor man. Because he's clearly not, He's struggling. He's struggling physically. Like, he, he just can't take it. Apparently, he has asthma. It looks like he's about to die. Mm -hmm. He's actually the first hostage who is released. Mm -hmm. The, I think the screenplay does a really good job of humanizing Al Pacino's character. Well, and the performance is... And the performance. Really good. I mean, I had to, I'm like, who did he lose to at the Oscars? It's Because it's so good. He lost to Jack Nicholson for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm, I mean, yeah. if that hadn't come out that year, he probably would have won. We received some questions about what we think about the film, which I'll save for later. But um, just the scene when the police come to the scene and they take over the barbershop across the street. I just kept thinking, like, 
you know, people's actions, like the ripple effect. Mm-hmm. Because now, like, law enforcement's commandeering this barbershop and the owner of the barbershop, I'm sure. Like, what if, because, like, well, because I'm thinking, like, what if that barbershop had a wife who's sick and he needs to make money to take care of her? And now I lost a day's pay because you over here trying to get money to take care of your wife. Mm -hmm. So we can get more into it. But that's, that was my main thought as we see everything unfold, which I think is um, skillful storytelling Mm -hmm. because. It's not because then we have the community surrounding him who at first they think he's like a hero because like, you know, cops aren't universally loved. And I'm sure in that community, people didn't love the cops. Then you have um, this bank being robbed and who loves the banks. So everyone's kind of cheering him on. He's kind of like a Robin Hood folk hero almost immediately. Until they find out he's gay. (laughs) Then they're turning on him. Mm -hmm. But then now you have like gay and trans people showing up, cheering him on. So it was a very interesting turn. I was also thinking like, you know, law enforcement really have to put themselves at risk every day. And I just don't, you know, like not to have an opinion one way or the other, except to say like, people really do have to put their lives on the line over some dumb shit. And like that negotiator. Charles Durning is pretty, is excellent in this too. Yeah. I don't know how much he was making, but it wouldn't have been enough for me to like, Because at one point he like takes off his jacket and says, I don't have a gun and approaches this, for all he knows, crazy person with a full militia Mm -hmm. who could blow my brains out at any minute. Yeah, no. (laughs) That's tough. The crowd is screaming Attica. Oh yeah, uh, because Pacino is, yeah. um, So then we see so the main story of the bank robbery then we also see like his wife being hysterical then we see his mom finding al pacino's mom finding out what he's doing and the dad is so like he doesn't care Mm -hmm. at all and the mom is saying like if he needed money why wouldn't he ask me (laughs) which i think is in the documentary we get a much bigger a better picture of john's relationship with his mother um so when he explains he wants to go to algeria and then john is saying he wants to see his wife so as the audience i because i didn't remember the movie i thought and we had already met his wife i thought the cops are going to go get the lady with the two kids and then all of a sudden leon shows up Mm -hmm. sarandon who they've taken out of the hospital the psychiatric facility I thought that was good, too, Uh because it was like a double shock. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, he's gay. Oh, wait. And the person we thought was his wife is actually. Well, and then uh, Sal starts getting mad because in the media, they start saying two homosexuals. (laughs) That's interesting, too. And I'll get to that in the documentary part. But yeah, Sal was real mad that they're calling him a homosexual. And Sal is not very bright either. No, but we find out pretty, like, when things start to go south, Sal says, like, well, you told me that if we did, if we weren't successful, we would kill ourselves. So it seems like Sal was already checked out. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why he agreed to rob the bank, which was pretty sad. But Maria, the housekeeper, Sonny cannot keep his ass uh, in the bank. He keeps, Al Pacino's character keeps coming outside. Well, it's hot in the bank also. (laughs) Right, but it's like, I mean, I'm assuming the cops didn't take him out because for fear of the other, his accomplice killing everyone inside. But he just stayed outside. And at one point, Maria's boyfriend comes and beats up Sonny. And he's on the ground beating him up and the cops like yank the man off of him. And then Sonny is able to get up and go back to talking shit and go back. (laughs) I was a little confused why they didn't just snatch him up at that point. Right? Well, because they didn't know what the guy in shot was going to do. So it's a situation. Then before um, Sonny's wife realizes he's gay and that he, but she knows that he's being accused of robbing the bank. She is like shouting, he would never do this. He would never. And so I felt like, Pat bad for this stupid one because it's not it's like not only is your man robbing actively robbing a bank but he's cheating on you <laughs> but then you also that that's where the scene where they're screaming at each other on the phone 
is pretty good because it's like, oh, I can see why. I can see why you don't want to be home with her, <laughs> which is mean to say. It is, but clearly they weren't meant for each other. All these spectators who like gather around an incident is so crazy to me. Looky lose, yeah. Because as soon as they hear a gunshot, they scatter like roaches, and it's like. The shit is on TV. Go home and watch it on TV. You want to stand in front of the bank being robbed? Like, <laughs> so Sonny is arguing with the negotiator. Like, you're not in charge. You're not in charge. I want to talk to the person in charge. And he's like, no, I am in charge. But then consistently, all of the cops surrounding the bank are not listening to the negotiator. <laughs> no, they're always, they always have their weapons dropped. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So when Leon finally shows up and he's like in his hospital gown looking very fragile. And I thought it's such a great scene when Leon finally makes eye contact with Sonny mm -hmm. and he just faints. It's like so dramatic. <laughs> and then they have him in the barbershop trying to revive him, Leon. And they give him smelling salts, <laughs> which I thought looked like poppers. So I thought it was funny that he took a hit and woke up. Oh, I was going to say all of these people visiting Sonny. It felt like Dickens' uh, Christmas, Christmas Carol. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, your everybody involved from your life has to come uh, have a say. So we find out that the sex change operation is $2,500, which in today's money would be like $18,000. So a significant amount. Um, we also find out that Sonny having his ceremony with Leon, his wife, um, was like a big wedding, like bridesmaids, his mother was there. Mm -hmm. They had a priest doing it. So that was interesting. Um, so when Leon finally gets on the phone with Sonny, because he doesn't want to talk to him initially, and he or he doesn't want to see him either, and he doesn't, uh, when he's on the phone with him and Sonny explains to Leon he wants to go to Algeria, then all of a sudden, Leon's like arguing with him. And then that's when they seem like a real couple. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you're so stupid. Why do you want to go to Algeria? Because immediately they start talking shit about Sal. It's like, oh, yeah, that's that feels like a couple. <laughs> that feels like being married, talking shit about everybody. <laughs> um. Or when Sal's like, he's like, where do you want? Sonny goes, where do you want to go? He's like, what country? He goes, Wyoming. <laughs> His dumb ass wants to go to Wyoming, the, the country of Wyoming. And I guess much, much of this script was technically improvised during rehearsal. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm always curious in films like this during this era. So when the gay and trans people show up to the scene and they're shouting like out of the closets into the streets, I wonder what the casting call for that was like, like we need obvious homosexuals because on site, like, <laughs> this, oh, this group of people look like homosexuals. The gays came, yeah. <laughs> um, Oh, so Sonny's wife's annoying. The mom's annoying. She shows up. But you know what? She's probably like what my mom would do. Like over, like, shut up. Don't tell these law enforcement people anything. Why are you telling them my full history? Yeah, she's like, I'm talking to the FBI. I'm like, okay. Um, Sonny, when, because now it's turned into nighttime. They've been there for hours. It's It's been a long day, night. And so he has one of the bank employees dictate his will. And I was very confused by the numbers because he says he has a $10,000 life insurance policy. Then he says, I want to give $2,700 to Leon for the sex change operation and any money that's left over give to him. But then I want to give 5,000 to like, I didn't understand his math. So it confused me. Um, okay. So part of the deal was if, if you release one hostage, we'll let you get on the phone. If you release another hostage, we'll um, get you a van. If you release another hostage, we'll take you to the airport. And then at the airport, you can get on the plane if you release everyone. So when the van comes, it's this black driver. And Lee, uh, Sonny is inspecting the van. And the black driver is being pretty cool. And then Sonny says, like, I want him to drive. I want him to drive me. I'm not stupid. Like, and... I thought that the driver did a good job of pretending to be just like a random guy, but then Sonny sniffs out that he is a cop and he is, but I didn't quite understand what made Sonny know that he was a cop. I think it, because he acquiesced to driving. Right? Yes. But I mean, would, I mean, would you have gotten that? Well, no, but I'm also not 
in that mind frame sure to be having to uh do double think <laughs> i thought the sound editing once they get into the van was really good because it felt like chaotic like there is too much like we've all because like everyone's so damn sweaty because it's like the dog days of summer and it's kind of quiet and they're shouting. And then when we transition to the van and just the chaos of the helicopters and the spectators, and I thought that was really well done. Cause I was like very anxious knowing that there's no way this could end well. Uh, the plane they're supposed to get on is called Modern Air. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, is that like the Spirit Airlines of the seventies? <laughs> that shit looked cheap as hell. It did. So it's clear that the hostages have sort of like i don't know the word not bonded but like they have a fondness maybe or they feel bad they, they kind of have some stockholm syndrome going on i think yeah and maria actually uh tells sal like because he's afraid to fly because he's a we find out he's afraid to fly she's like you'll be okay and then she gives him her rosary beads which i thought was really sweet and we see him sort of like lighten up and then that's when the fbi agent shoots him dead in the head <laughs> who is played by Lance Henriksen. All from Aliens? Mm -hmm. Yes. And many, many other films. Uh, my last note pertaining to this film is, because um, we watched it on Amazon, you know how Amazon has tags for the movie, like action thriller. It also tagged this movie as um, outlandish and strange. <laughs> I don't think it's outlandish or strange. I think it's a really unique story to tell. I agree. Well, there's a lot of things going on because ultimately it's strangely got some very romantic underpinnings that might go away after you watch the documentary. <laughs> yeah. But as a, like a procedural bank heist film, I think it's pretty good. Oh, it's excellent. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then I have to talk about the dog, which is the documentary about John, whose last name I have a hard time with. What? Wajitits or well, he doesn't pronounce the J. I noticed. Well, oh, okay. So the real guy, what a witch. So comparing Dog Day Afternoon to the actual guy, so Sonny to John. So John is like a very out homosexual, like very, very, um, like very open about it. He was part of the gay liberation movement. He's very active. Very like yeah, in his sexual practices. So, and he says he's gay, but mm -hmm. that he, you know, he also likes sex and finds women attractive. But, so I'm thinking that the filmmakers thought for 1970, whatever, when they started developing the story, that they couldn't, to get an Al Pacino to make this a serious film, to have this director, maybe like, we couldn't make it super gay. <laughs> like it had to sort of be ambiguous and maybe a gag. I think they wanted the shock value of how it's revealed. We find out John, so Leon, his wife, uh, Sonny's wife, in reality, this person's name was um, Ernie. John did not want Ernie to get a sex change. So I thought that was interesting that it, it, it wasn't until their relationship was kind of on the rocks that he finally decided that she could. We find out that before they went to rob the bank, like like the few hours before they went to go watch The Godfather <laughs> and the note they gave to the bank when they were robbing them, the end of the note said like, this is an offer you can't refuse. And he signed it as The Godfather. <laughs> That's so corny. But he's like the dog father. Yeah. In Dog Day Afternoon, the the newspaper journalist calls him right mm -hmm. they call the bank to talk to sunny yeah. and sunny's confused but in reality sunny called the newspaper or john called the newspaper so overall john seems like someone who likes a lot of attention he wants to be a big deal his his idea to rob the bank seemed a lot more like he was like a big tough guy and he was going to show everyone versus in the film. It seems like he was a desperate man who wanted to do something for someone he loved. Right. Uh, John, you know, the film doesn't give any backstory as to who Sonny is, but um, John had a pretty rough childhood. His mom 
he has two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother. And the older brother may have had some developmental issues, but I think also suffered from a seizure disorder and was taken away from the family. And then his younger brother has some severe developmental issues and cannot take care of himself. So the environment he grew up in uh, was very interesting. He had a very close relationship with his mother that I don't think was the most appropriate, not like sexually, but just like the way he would talk to her and how she babied him. Mm -hmm. Attachment issues. Uh, and he also survived Vietnam. That's right. He's a veteran. Um, we find out that he had skin cancer and breast cancer, but he did not want treatment, which is why he died relatively young. Um, so Ernie, his wife, who then had the sex change, she, her doctors told her, after, like when they agreed to do it and sign off and she had it, they told her part, like they recommended that she never talk to him again. But when she doesn't, after she gets her sex changed, she gets an agent and tries to make money by doing appearances. And she does like um, pornography and all kinds of stuff to make money. But in one interview, they have like, they did an interview with John in prison and asked him to talk to her directly. So via like recorded video. And then at one point she asks him, what would you have done had I actually gone to the bank? Because she never actually like went up to the bank and saw him. That's what he wanted, but she didn't do it. Mm -hmm. She didn't do it in the movie either. What if I would have gone to the bank door and, and talked to you and you told me to leave with you and I said no? Because John wanted to go to Denmark so that she could get her surgery. And John tells this lady while he's being recorded that if she would have said no, he would have killed her. They hint at that violence uh, in the movie. Because Chris Sarandon tells Charles Durning that that he's been beaten by Sonny. Mm -hmm. But in the documentary, he says that's not true. He says that one day he came home and his wife was trying to kill herself and he tried to stop her and she attacked him. And But the interviewer also asked, like, you know, she's asking the wife, like, what did you see in John and vice versa? Like, John, what did you see in Ernie? And the answers were really interesting because John's like, I don't know. Like, Ernie was like horrible at sex. So it wasn't that like. Okay. So then, of course, he gets sent to prison. He gets in there and then he meets a guy who he makes his third wife, this black Irish guy, and then has a relationship with him because while he's in prison, then John's sentence was reduced. So he only spent like five or six years in prison. And when he gets out, he and his jailhouse wife move in with John's mother. Mm -hmm. And then their relationship faltered. And as John got older and he couldn't take care of himself. Um, he lived with his mom the entire time. The mom outlived him. Mm -hmm. And then we find out that he would bring in like, basically like homeless sex workers to stay with him. Obviously trying to get something from them in exchange for a place to sleep and some food. All the while the dad is still in the house and would just never even acknowledge what was happening. As one does. The mom told a story of how when John was in prison, because the wife, his wife, who he had two children with, she would visit him and we get a recording of him requesting all kinds of candy bars. <laughs> his teeth are terrible. His teeth are really bad. Like real yeah. bad. Mm -hmm. um, but then the mom was like, oh, yeah, I would sneak in stuff in my bra. And the interviewer was like, what would you take him? This lady was taking his ass pickles, goat cheese, and meat. Pickles, goat cheese, and meat. Goat cheese. Stuffed in her in titty. Her, in your bra. Oh, no. Warm, Ugh. moist goat cheese. Uh, in the movie, the father is played by uh, the uh, Dominic Chinese, who did, uh, who's Junior Soprano in The oh. Sopranos. We find out that when the movie came out, Dog Day Afternoon, and John was still in prison, he had a private screening of it. And then he... Then he threatened to riot if he didn't get that. Yeah, he threatened to riot, have, in, incite a riot if the prison warden didn't play the movie for all of the prisoners. So they did. But he said that it was for his own safety because for all the time he had been in there, he was saying, like, there's going to be a movie about me. So he felt like if he didn't show it, like, it would invalidate him. 
So isn't that crazy? I feel like that was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also Matthew Broderick's dad is one of the law enforcement agents, James Broderick. Oh. You kept asking who that was. You thought he looked familiar. Who? Oh, yeah. That's Matthew Broderick's dad? Yeah. Yeah, he looks familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I feel bad for saying this, but when we meet, when we meet the real life wife of John, she was equally as annoying as the wife in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> she talked too damn much. So, of course, there's a lot of time spent with John out of prison, and he clearly is a very self-centered man who likes attention. His ass was going to that Chase Bank, taking pictures in front of it, signing autographs, and then we get some of the bank employees, some of whom were the ones there the night or the day it got robbed, talking about like how they feel about seeing this man who robbed them all those years ago, signing autographs in front. Yeah. Rewatching Dog Day Afternoon, I wondered if any of them kept in touch or how that experience changed them. We also learned, um, so Leon, you know, when she got her sex change, changed her name to Liz. She regrets, she says in her own words that she regrets getting it. And that it kind of was just like a whirlwind, like this thing that she hadn't fully sort of reconciled within herself. But then this man does this thing and there's all this pressure and media attention. And then she does it and it just created a new set of problems. So I felt really bad for her. And then ultimately she um, she ended up having to be a, uh, become a sex worker to just survive and died from AIDS. So her story is really tragic. Mm -hmm. um, but... And does it, that uh, she's probably deserving of her own film. Oh, I was thinking this should have, someone needs to remake Dog Day Afternoon as like a mini series, like on Amazon Prime, because I think the most interesting part of the story is everything outside of the bank. Yeah, and the I mean the complex nature of John, Sonny, um, and then Leon, Liz, uh, Ernie <laughs> slash Ernie. Uh, I think that person's super interesting. Yeah. This could definitely be remade because also they could focus more on the reality of what people were thinking as it was happening. It does kind of show like once people realize he's gay during this standoff, how the tides change. Mm -hmm. But it would be interesting to get sort of like, you know, if it were a miniseries, you know, getting more time with people and what they think about it. Because in 1972, whatever, like seeing that on TV and they're showing pictures of the wife because they have wedding photos of Sonny marrying Leon, but in a bridal gown. I mean, that must have been very shocking to people. Oh, yeah. I mean, primetime television. Uh, it won an Oscar. Well, Chris Rennan and Pacino were nominated for acting uh, and supporting in lead categories. But Frank Pearson, who also wrote another 70s classic, Cool Hand Luke, won an Oscar for Best Screenplay. Uh, and notably, was also lensed by Victor J. Kemper, who also shot in Justice for All with Pacino. Oh, okay. So there were some interesting questions we were asked to answer for this movie. So we can do that. Knowing this is based off of a real person, did knowing that make you love him for how far he went to provide for his trans girlfriend and wanting to see her be happy? I mean, I think if I only watched the movie, it and, is- And didn't know it was based on a true story? Then, I mean, I mean, whether or not it's based on a real person, I think how the film is presented, he's kind of romantic and noble. <laughs> yeah. So I find Pacino's portrayal of John as kind of rather appealing in that way, even though what he does has significant consequences and it's, you know, the wrong thing to do. I agree. Since you saw the documentary of this man, did seeing the real man and his feelings of the event in question make you realize that, yes, he did a bad thing, but did it for a good reason? Did that make you like him less or more? I definitely liked the man less when I met John. <laughs> uh, well, yes. I mean, it, because the reality of uh, his persona was uh, it, it, just a lot more toxic. Uh, and there are a lot more other ambiguities about him that the film doesn't really have time or care right. to or you know at the time the those that are writing and directing it were really interested in exploring those facets of this uh gay man's sexuality but 
I think meeting him and realizing how self-centered he is and egomaniacal and I mean, a, a, a therapist would assign other names or diagnoses to him, I'm sure. But like he, I don't think he's noble. I think he's um, out of control. Yeah. Maladjusted. I don't think he accounted for how his actions affected or would affect other people. And also we can't forget because of his actions, a man was shot and killed, Sal, who also the real Sal is quite attractive, more attractive than John. So I think it's funny in the movie, they make John more attractive than Sal because they make Sal in the movie look like well, John Cazale looks like a bird. Looks like a vampire with that hair. But. So that's an interesting choice. Well, and you know what's also interesting is uh, he has that line. Oh, Penelope Allen, I really like as the head bank tiller, Sylvia. Uh, he has that because she's trying to smoke inside the bank, and uh, Sal is like, "Oh, the cancer's going to get you. I don't smoke." But ironically, he died of lung cancer. It, like he was in a, a state of uh, disrepair by the time he did the deer hunter and Meryl Streep had to step in to get him kept on the film. Oh, speaking of Sal, um, in the movie, he's upset he's being called a homosexual because he's saying he's not. But in the documentary, John is saying that Sal was gay and that right the night before they did the heist, when he and the other guy got together, they were staying in like a hotel room like they were having sex, John and the third guy, and then Sal wanted to have sex with the third guy, but the third guy rejected him and he was upset. So it's funny that in the film, they make it a point that he's not gay, which I guess adds to the... the well, it's a way for us to also realize how most people's attitudes was towards, towards gay men or being called gay. Or homosexual like it's there's a you know sal has a, a visceral reaction to that yeah um, yeah another question did knowing that john committing this crime then serving his time and becoming a productive member of society after these events make you feel better about him as a person uh, i don't think he was a productive member of society he was on welfare <laughs> like until he died lived with his mama all he did was look for sex um he was quite the pervert and he called himself a pervert uh, although nothing wrong with being hyper, hypersexual. Well, I mean, there's something wrong with being hypersexual, but... Yeah, there's some compulsion issues. Right, but I mean, the fact that he likes sex is not why I think he's not productive. But um, yeah, I don't think he was a productive member of society. And I think, I don't know that... I don't know that he was doing this because he loved this his wife, this woman, so, this trans woman so much. I think he just was out of control and thought that that was a way to get to her. Yeah, I, I see him watching the documentary. It's it's apparent, it's readily apparent that he's quite manipulative. I, yeah, I find him more manipulative than like a loving partner who was doing whatever he could. Because the other thing too is like, well, this is the next question. Have you ever been in a relationship with a man like this who would go go to daring lengths to help you get to be happy by being your true self? I mean, yeah, but da like daring links? I don't know that, no, not daring links. I think people make sacrifices. And this is the problem I have with this situation is like what he did was wrong. Like you can't steal. We, You know, that's not right to steal from people. You also affected a lot of other people. You weren't doing a risk assessment. Like lives could have been lost. There actually was someone who was killed. And if, if you really care about me and I'm going to do something crazy to try to do something for you, I feel like you should say, like, hold on. <laughs> I don't want to put you at risk. Right. Just me knowing that you are willing to help me is enough. Like, $2,500 in 1972 or one is a lot of money, but it's not a million dollars. Like, they could have had a plan. Also, John had a lot of things he needed to figure out on his own. His girlfriend, wife, like, I keep messing up the names, uh, Leon, like in the movie, or mm -hmm. Ernie in real life. It's like, if I were Ernie, I would think like, because Ernie already has an impression of John that he's unstable, he's crazy and abusive. It's already irresponsible to then be like, yeah, you can go rob a bank 
not that Ernie knew that he was going to do that, but I just think what happened was really like what John wanted to do. And that doesn't make any sense, but I wouldn't expect someone who I care about to do something that would put them at risk. Like we could make a plan. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. We can make a plan. Sacrifices could be made. It's not always about money, right? Like if I needed $2,500, I could get $2,500, but, or whatever, you know, if I needed a hundred thousand dollars, I could get it. Maybe not at this exact moment, but we can make a plan to figure out how to get it. So a man, a plan, a canal. So I think like making sacrifices is different than doing dumb shit that could affect us both. Right. Mm -hmm. If I care about you, do I want you in jail? Right. Like now I'm worse off than I was, mm -hmm. but a very interesting story. I agree. Yeah. I can't believe you didn't remember it at all. No. Um, I need to take a small break. Do you want to go through these comments? What would you give the film? Oh, I would give the film four out of five. I, I, oh, I, this is a, to me, this is a five out of five film as is network. As is the fugitive comes. network is five out of five for me. But <clears throat> this one, the only issue I feel is like I just wanted a little bit more about the person. Like I feel like I'm witnessing something mm -hmm. that I would like if I were at home watching this on TV happening in real time, I'd be trying to search like all these things. And I don't know. I it's an excellent movie. Mm -hmm. Excellent. But it did leave me wanting. Something like network is like. I mean, it's just perfect. I, I, for what this is, I think this is, you could say this is a perfect film too. It did, as I was watching it and when it finished, I did feel like there were, there was a, something a little, like there was a little bit missing for me. Really? That doesn't make it bad. It's just, it left me wanting for a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit more about who the man was, but get a slightly better understanding of that relationship. But I don't think anything was poorly done. It's an excellent movie. Uh -huh. And I would give the documentary The Dog three and a half out of five. I think I gave that that as well. Um, can you go through these while I take a small break? Okay. Go ahead. I think it's also worth noting, uh, if you haven't seen Sidney Lumet's last film, which was uh, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead with, I think it's Philip Seymour Hoffman and Ethan Hawke. That's a, that was a, a really high note for him to go out on from 2007. Um, Okay. Oh yeah, cruising with Pacino. Yeah, it's funny to. We didn't actually talk about that, but having Sarandon and Pacino, who are clearly heterosexual men, because you know Sarandon was married. That's where Susan Sarandon gets her surname from. And I think the meaningfulness of having these people at that time play that with Pacino right after Godfather Two uh, had a kind of a legitimizing effect. That of course you know, now can be construed as the opposite with, you know, playing gay face. But, you know, Cruising, I think, is also an excellent underrated film uh, that I think the gay community made a point of uh, eviscerating the year it came out when I, I think they really should have focused more on something like Windows with Talia Shire, because that, Talia, yeah, that film is a lot more problematic to me than Cruising, which I think has been recuperated in the years since. But yeah, I would like to rewatch Heat. Um, oh, it did something, I don't know what it did. Oh, we done messed up, hold on. There you go. Back, back, back again. Oh, someone's partner's Guatemalan. Is Coco Peru the drag queen? Her husband is Latino and part of her most recent comedy special, wherever he's from, I think is what, Guatemala. He, she kept saying, "My husband, who's from Guatemala." <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I thought that was cute. Hi, Portugal. Where did you stop? Somewhere in there. Uh, I didn't get very far. Someone watched this for the first time and was blown away. It is very good. The offense with oh, that's a Lumet film. I have seen that. I believe that's where it's an odd role for Sean Connery because he's he's the a cop in that struggling with some issues and there's some really i remember some intense scenes between him and his wife who he's going to hate someone found a rent control department in nyc good for you <laughs> congratulations yeah isn't there a horror movie coming out where a woman kills and cooks people 
Are you familiar with that? Uh, maybe. It's Prince of the City. Uh, that's a Lumet film with Treat Williams. There was a big break for Treat. Oh, we just watch uh, a Treat movie. Hair. Uh, Murder on the Orient Express. I don't love, well, it's better than Kenneth Branagh's version. Um, and Death Trap is an interesting Lumet film. That is with Michael Caine and Christopher Reeve. And there's a huge twist based on a play. There's a huge twist uh, because at the end of it, it's revealed that Michael Caine and Christopher Reeve are gay and they're lovers and there's a kiss scene. And apparently, uh, this is in the celluloid closet, that people walked out of the theater in droves and they called it the million dollar kiss because that money, that movie lost all this money because of the gay content. So where do you get your t-shirts from? Uh, Redbubble. I haven't bought anything new in a while. Um, yeah, so the pronoun usage in this film is very confusing, but after watching the documentary, I mean, John describing his wives, lovers, boyfriends, I mean, it's also inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to get a handle on what people prefer to be referred to as. So it the, the film is kind of accurate in that because, yeah, when John's talking about his wives and but then also referring to them as him and their boy name versus yeah it's it is confusing well we're, we're also talking about relationships and 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 people that just were we were refusing to recognize culturally so without that there's no kind of lingo in place for what's a proper terminology either true but he's and he's also it's like knowing that he didn't want her to have the sex change operation, but then is respecting her to call her his wife? Or was he doing that because he didn't want to say husband? Yeah. Even from the documentary, I was a little confused on why he's choosing certain language. But well, it's like, funny. yeah. And he's very, and John seems to be into ownership because that that's what that is. That that's, it's, uh, providing some sense of ownership. You're mine in a way, which, I feel like the culture has shifted away from those kind of things. The cat's name is Aggie. As an Agnew. Although Angus is funny. <laughs> Isn't there a movie about a chubby kid named Angus in the 90s? Or what's Dingus from? That's John C. Riley. That's right. Uh, as Dr. Dr. Stephen Brule. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dingus. Um, John Cazali was a good actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Sarandon is quite handsome. Mm -hmm. You don't remember? He, I don't know who that is, but... From The Princess Bride, from Fright Night. Is he the... Oh, who's my friend? Uh, Colin Farrell. Is he Colin Farrell's character? Yeah. Or from Colin the, Farrell is his character? From the remake. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's... He was married to Susan Sarandon. That's where she gets her name. I know that. Yeah. Okay. The, someone's looking forward to The Nun too. Mm. I hope it's better than the first one. Yeah. They really took like a very peripheral character and made an entire movie. Mm. And I didn't think the plot was where well, it needed there, to be. There's a whole sub, there's a franchise about the doll too. Yeah. Um, I love the one, one bank teller who was chewing gum the whole time and was trying to stunt to get on camera the whole time. Mm -hmm. Well, she seemed like she was Miriam. Yeah, like the, like she doesn't have a lot of excitement in her life, mm -hmm. and maybe she felt safe with Sonny, mm -hmm. like he wasn't going to hurt them. So she was just, hey, at that point, if it were me, I'd be like, well, imagine the book I can write when I get out of here. <laughs> I can get on Good Morning America with Gail King and start crying. Uh, okay, John was a big old queen. Who's Jonathan Tucker? Uh, he's in, somebody just referenced Palm Trees and Power Lines. Oh. He's, he's the one that's kind of grooming the young women. The handsome younger guy? Yeah, well, he's probably in his 40s now. The like, the, the, the redhead or the blonde guy? He let me pull up a picture. The one who is like the main character. Mm-hmm. The one who we see shirtless a lot. Uh huh. He's in his forties. I think so. Oh, I recall him. He's he seemed younger. Well, because I remember he was a young man in the Deep End. Yeah, him. Tilda Swinton. That man's in his forties. Wow. 
I don't know if he was born in 82. Oh, wow. Uh, he's also in God is a Bullet, which you didn't watch, directed by Nick Cassavetes. The dog I watched on Fandango, or uh, what's it called? Fandor? Fandor. Fandango. Okay, Jerry. Hobo Camp. Uh, Kiss of the Spider Woman. Yeah, I'd love to rewatch that with William Hurt. <laughs> the dog sounds like the original Tiger King. Yeah, kind of. He's the, There's some similarities there. Yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. Actually. The hill. I have not seen The Hill, unless I'm getting The Hill confused with The Offense. The Offense was with Sean Connery? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The Star is Born. The the screenwriter of this directed was had the sad task, I think, of trying to direct Barbara Streisand and her vehicle. I'm drinking grapefruit flavored fresca. It's very refreshing. It's very refreshing mm -hmm. and it's sweet, but like zero calorie. So perfect for me. More chemicals in my body. Chemis. Are we having bad air quality here? Um, I don't know. No, I don't think so. I mean, I can't see the sky. No, <laughs> I, I, it's like usual. So I don't know. Um, we did review the blackening. I just got lost. Oh. Someone asked if we reviewed the blackening. If we're going to. Yeah, we already reviewed that. Um, who would you recast if Dog Days were remade? Well, it'd have to be a little guy. For some reason, Dave Franco popped into my head. <laughs> Is he, could he be up to the task? I don't know how good of an actor I think Dave Franco is. Oh, no. Who's the guy who says, would that what it were? Oh, Alden Ehrenreich. Alden Ehrenreich? Mm -hmm. He could be yeah. Sonny mm -hmm. uh, or John. Apparently Pacino, because after Godfather 2, he was exhausted and he's, you know, all method-y. And he, he told Lumet that he couldn't do it and it was offered to Dustin Hoffman and he said change his mind so Hoffman couldn't get it. We did review the Black Demon Shark movie. El, El so, Demonio Negro. El Demonio Negro. So mm -hmm. check it out. Joseph Robinson's autobiography chapter two. Mm. <laughs> uh, well I'm lost. Uh, okay. The Deep End. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Tilda Swinton and Jonathan Tucker. It's a remake of a Max Ophel's film um, uh, that I'm forgetting the name of. We were going to review Everybody, but then we got busy. So it's already out. Yeah, it came out yesterday. Have you ever considered directing or producing? I don't think you'd be good at, you definitely wouldn't be good at producing. Uh, I don't think you'd be good at directing either. I think you, you're a You'd be better at writing. I think if I had complete control, I'd be fine at directing. Oh, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely Oh, yeah. Not. A Reckless Moment is the Max Ophel's film. You wouldn't be a... Uh, you wouldn't... No. The actors would hate you. I'd be like... Otto, <laughs> I'd probably be like Otto Preminger. The actors would hate you. This is the line. Say this goddamn line. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't recommend that at all. Oh, your mom died? Well, you have to finish this film. <laughs> no. No, I, I think I'd be better than that. Mm. There's stagnant air in LA. Okay. Oh. Well, our phone will tell us. Um, oh, Casey Affleck could be mm. John. Mm. Miles Teller. Yeah. Mm. He's a little too big, isn't he? I don't know. Miles Teller's like a big guy. Although Sigourney's filming a movie with him now, but I mm, doesn't excite me. Can we all agree that Patrick Swayze is hot as a man and in drag? Yeah. He's very handsome. Mm -hmm. He's a handsome lady. <laughs> yes. Have we ever watched BoJack Horseman? Uh, I watched like three episodes. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. It's just like I'll start something and like it and then there's, there's never any time. Nick is a movie encyclopedia. Sometimes. Oh, did you post something on... Letterbox about Black Mirror? I did. Oh, you can just rate one episode? You d Apparently you can. Letterbox is so weird with television because like the idol is not on there 
or the lost flowers of Alice Hart. Um, so I, I, so I'm unclear about where they delineate uh, television products. You've watched of all six seasons, maybe like six episodes. Mm -hmm. And then you watched the one with Salma Hayek and Annie Murphy. Joan is awful. Joan is awful. Hello, South Africa. We haven't watched Beef in only one episode of The Last of Us. The Idol is uh, so annoying to me. <laughs> I don't think. I mean, are, are you going to try to finish it? I probably will, but I, I, I didn't like Lily Rose Depp before, and I don't like her anymore now. And uh, the weekend is, I mean, playing himself in Uncut Gems is one thing, but I don't find him very appealing. Yeah, I know the character. His character is supposed to be kind of vile, but like. Ugh, I I just don't, as an actor, I just find him really unappealing. And Lily Rose Depp is like a pop star. She just doesn't, I, I don't know. I don't know how she's successful. Because she's Johnny Depp and Vanessa Paradis. Oh, no, that, I mean, in that show, like, I don't understand how that person is like a pop star. Well, see, Britney Spears opened the door for, we can make, we're supposed to believe that. Yeah, but anything. Britney Spears makes sense because she seems manufactured. So I actually think someone like a Britney Spears would actually, I think the idol would have been better if we would have, because Lily Rose Depp's character is kind of like a bad girl anyway. So the fact that she's doing, I don't know, it feels very like Fifty Shades of Grey to me, like very. It's trying so hard. It's to trying be so hard to be. Provocative and edgy. edgy. It's like, mm. But she's already kind of nasty and. I don't know, smoking all those cigarettes already makes her seem kind of, like, I mean, just like, what are we doing? I'm guessing that's going to become a control issue because we've only seen the first two episodes and he his character makes a comment about her smoking. She also can't really dance. No. And then they're really acting like she's, she ain't no Beyonce. But um, yeah, I don't like that one. Uh, okay. What are we having for dinner? I don't know. I made manicotti the other night. You made manicotti. You made spaghetti last night. Mm -hmm. We have leftover spaghetti. We do, but so. that's lunch, not dinner. What are we having for dinner? I don't know. You tell me. Um, okay. Well, we should probably end the call video. <laughs> Because I got to fix the other two videos I accidentally posted. <laughs> uh huh. Um, I do not cook at all. Well, sometimes. Rare. What, what have I cooked? Well, he made some grits once. I don't enjoy cooking. You make a good uh, tres leches cake. I'm not like stupid. I, I could read instructions and turn on an oven. And like, I'm actually quite good at following instructions, but I don't enjoy cooking at all it's not worth the effort for me to then eat in like three minutes and i have to clean up no you're more like like a like a kid in sixth grade science class but cooking how so uh, like there's one time i don't know why we had canned sweet potatoes and you thought you wanted to make a sweet potato pie without looking at a recipe that was not edible it was not good yeah, but that was like, I mean, how often do I bake something? No. I was inspired, so I tried. Um, if I were single, I would never, my kitchen would never be used, ever. And there'd be nothing in my refrigerator except like a few pre-made things that I could nibble on. But yeah, because when you're not around, I just buy like deli stuff mm -hmm. and I'll just nibble on it until it runs out. Mm -hmm. um, do Joseph does do, he does clean. He likes He's 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 not well, he's not mad at me. It's the dirt. Kind I don't. Of I, I actually hate cleaning, but I like things to be clean. So I think the reason I'm always angry is because I don't like. I just wish that some people could clean as they go. That's my style. So nothing's ever dirty because I'm always like, if I use a dish, I put it in the dishwasher, clean the sink, done. And then some people will let dishes, you know pile up and then be like, oh, later the day I'll clean. That's not my style, but I do not like cleaning. Some people. Well, I don't like to accuse people of things. <laughs> you know, I'm not an argumentative person. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I'm not interested in fighting right now. Oh, hey, Shirley. <laughs> oh, someone's encouraging you to be shady. Okay. <laughs> Someone's dog heard dinner and now they're begging for a treat. Oh, that's like, what did we just watch with cocaine? Oh, the Jennifer Lawrence movie. What's the dog's name? <laughs> so I could call the dog for dinner. <laughs> okay. Well, the theme for our next video, I don't know what it'll be. I I want to do brothel madams. Ugh. What? Some movies we no one's heard of. And We'll see. You can give me five films and I'll see what that looks like. Well, we can't do next week. Oh, we can't do next week. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because I'll be out of town. Animation. Well, yeah, because you, Salon Kitty is actually one of my selections <laughs> um, with a great Ingrid Tulin. But, and uh, yeah, we, we need to watch uh, Into and Across the Spider Verse. Joseph sounds like this roommate I did not like. Ooh. I had roommates who were so dirty and it was like, ugh. But I wasn't a monster about it. I would just, you know what would happen? I would just get mad and then not talk to them. <laughs> like in college, ugh. No, you still do that. Well, it's just like, come on. It's, we're adults. Like, let's keep shit clean. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But you know, I think the problem is too, well, some people are just filthy. Like you'll just wallow in your own mess and you won't do anything about it. Be, and I know this because people's version, you know, some people who aren't very tidy, when they do tidy up, you can see that like, oh, you don't know what clean is. Like this is acceptable to you. That's a lot of people. You go to people's homes or sit in their car and it's like, oh, this was what you thought was okay to have guests over. I hate a dirty car. That's probably my number one thing. My, you will never get into my... Have you ever seen my car dirty? Whitney will never be fat. Whitney will... Joseph will never have a dirty car. Mm -hmm. No. Because it's so easy to keep it clean. We have a garage, to be fair. But every day I just wipe it down with a little duster. I got my little chamois. It, it only takes like a minute. And my car is always clean. I have a little vacuum that plugs into the charger... And, you know, I'll pick up my little pebbles on the floor mat. If you do a little bit every day, then it's never a big deal. But then if, like, if I had to clean maybe, let's say, your car, it would take me a minute. I'd have to detail it. It's not that bad. The I inside? Just it. The inside. The inside is fine. Did they clean the inside? No. It's fine. And if you were that meticulous about other things and putting in little work here and there... Just think about that. If we could apply that same sense of oh, stewardship to other areas in life. I think what you're talking about is altruism. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there are things that are important to me that I put energy into, just like you put energy into other things. Mm -hmm. See, and there you go. And together, what a wonderful world. <laughs> Bianca Del Rio said, apply it to the challenge. <laughs> Yes. So if you ever uh, invite to like take me on a ride somewhere or pick me up, don't get me in a dirty car. Well, let's not get into cars with strangers. Also, established connections are good for <laughs> that. Yeah, but still, like, it's so disrespectful to me. Well, yeah. I mean, just like you don't. What do you, I mean? If somebody's not completely clean when you're doing other things, like. Well, the bathroom, like. Well, Sure. Yeah, as a case. In point. Why would I want to use a dirty ass bathroom? And you invited me here, knowing that I would probably need to use the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I just don't think that's very considerate, and it says a lot about people. Because then I extrapolate, like, what else? If your toilet seat is covered in poo and fecal matter, I mean, you know, are your dishes clean? I don't, I mean, I, you have to think, like, if people aren't clean, if you're very messy in one area, you can't tell me you're sufficiently clean in another. It, that, that doesn't even make sense, right? Mm -hmm. There's no way. Wow. I could just go on and on. Yeah, he could. He could. <laughs> like Judy Garland here, go on singing. Okay. Well, we should probably have lunch. I apologize for all the technical issues.
our microphone wasn't working. Anyway, I don't like excuses. Okay. Do you have anything else you want to say? No. Ta-ta for now.